Okay, so I'll start with the presentation. Tell me, top pair, your hands are up. You want to say something? Okay, she didn't want to say anything. Okay. Um, screen, yeah. Okay. It's coming up, please. Okay. So, um, like I said, this was quite impromptu, right? So this is actually supposed to be for cohort um, five. This was actually given in cohort four, the first week of cohort four. So just ignore the week one cohort four, right? I'm just using the same slide from the last cohort, right? So um, let, me, let me put up the participant stuff here. Okay, so I can see when someone has a question. So sorry, if you have questions at any point in time, feel free to raise your hands, right? Um, can anybody see what I'm moving around on the screen? Like uh, this Zoom stuff, I want to be sure I'm not blocking anyone's view. You can unmute. Maybe someone should just answer on the behalf of everyone. You can't see. Yeah, we can see. Okay, you can't see. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, can see. So I am, I'm talking about this um, in the project on what you guys are saying on the shared screen. So I don't block anyone's view. You're not blocking the screen. Okay, okay, it's fine. Okay, so I'll start. Okay, so the very first question that we always ask is, um, what is machine learning, right? So, well, this, I'm um, sorry. The first question is, what is artificial intelligence? Or I was distracted. <laughs> but before we start, there's, there's this um, thing we always do here. Yeah? We try to see, pardon me, just give me one, one second, please. Okay, sorry, I had to quickly attend to something. So the first question is, what is artificial intelligence, yeah? So how many of you know any of these guys on the screen? If you know them, raise up your hands. Now you are. Okay, everybody, majority of the guys know. Them, yeah. So there's something about this. Um, let's move on to the next slide. How about these people? How many of you know these guys here? Yeah, a few people know them. <clears throat> right? So but if you know these guys very well, it means you watch movies, right? So there's something common about all these guys. And the one thing that is common about them is um, prophecy, right? Atem At Atemis, Athena, these are all goddess. Yeah, goddess, yeah, and gods, semi-gods, yeah. And then on the other side, where we have um, Achilles, Udesis, and Ag Agamemnon. I can't really pronounce their names. These guys are 
probably they are they are more or less like people that were prophes that they had prophesied would um, come to part to be yeah and there's something um, similar there's something similar about all these characters yeah. what do we something will happen in the future right and uh, when we're putting up, when, okay, this was actually done by um, George. So when he was putting it up, he, he was trying to um, show you the relationship between artificial in intelligence and God, yeah? So he was trying to tell you that, tell us that, see, artificial intelligence is more or less like a semi-God, yeah? That is able to prophesy things that will happen, right? Because, hey, <coughs> these are gods, yeah? And they're able to predict what will happen in future. And here you have artificial intelligence doing the same thing, predicting what is going to happen in future, right? So, um, so now, yeah. So, but artificial intelligence, like I have said, is basically being able to predict something that will happen in the future. And um, yeah. it's machine learning, which is at the core of um, artificial intelligence, simply is just, it's, it's just a way of artificially, um, it's just a way of <coughs> achieving artificial intelligence. So machine learning is basically a way or it's, it's just a way of making predictions, right? Artificial intelligence on its own is more or less like a concept, yeah? But machine learning is what tries to achieve that artificial intelligence, right? So, but if we look at let's let's look at this overview of artificial intelligence here yeah? so here we have artificial intelligence at the outer layer of the core right at the inner layer of the really trying to tell us is that it's what i have said earlier at the outer um, layer of the core of, 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 of this um, diagram we have artificial intelligence which is like um yes yeah or by, by biology or any it's it's artificial right and in order to um achieve artificial intelligence machine learning came to be right and at the core of machine learning today is what we is where we have um, deep learning right so for this um cohort yeah with data science and machine learning track we are going to be focusing mainly on machine learning not deep learning because deep learning is quite more advanced right okay Shinima, do you have a question <laughs> no, no but i i just did yeah so like so the is it is this like the progression like data science machine learning deep learning than artificial intelligence or they are all artificial intelligence like I would like some image to compare it okay so let me let me let me break it down better right <laughs> so, let me go back so let me start again yeah artificial intelligence saying um, an intelligence that is not natural, right? An intelligence that is not based on um, any biological intelligence or any, any, any sort of thing, right? It's just a concept, artificial intelligence. You can, you can try to make something artificially intelligent by maybe um, explicitly, explicitly, explicitly writing programs, right? You can try to make something intelligent by using mathematical models, right? But it's a concept, artificial intelligence. But now, artificial intelligence, that, that, that um, particular um, 
aim to achieve artificial intelligence was better um, achieved through machine learning. So that's why if you, if you go back to what we said here, right, in this slide, at its core, machine learning is simply a way of achieving artificial intelligence, right? Doesn't mean that there are no other ways of achieving artificial intelligence, but machine learning is a way or one of the most efficient ways of achieving artificial intelligence. Now, machine learning um, kind of got more advanced, yeah? And then deep learning came out of machine learning, yeah? That's why you see at the core here, what we have is what? Deep learning, which came out of what machine learning, right? So now, the, the, the thing about data science, machine learning, deep learning. Data science is a concept or of trying to find, get insights from data, right? But one thing you will notice as we go through the course is that you would need data science knowledge to be able to correctly or to be able to correctly yeah, apply machine learning to problems or deep learning to problems. So you are having data science, which is basically being able to manipulate data, right? And get insights from data. Now, if you're able to get insights from this data, it means that you, you should be able to make useful predictions from the data you have gotten useful insights from, right? Is it clear? Yes, it's clear, thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so machine learning uses basically uses data to produce a program to perform a tax, right? So when we say uh, machine learning uses data to produce a program to perform a tax, it doesn't mean that um, we are writing step-by-step um, -step codes that try to make predictions, right? So uh, one of the hand, one of the, what, what I mean, By this is like the, uh, the example to the to the left, right? You would find out here that the activity of this is trying to like predict the activity of a human being, right? And then you can see that um, the activity of a human being could consist of walking, climbing a step, sitting, standing, and then maybe lying down or sleeping, right? And you can actually reduce this to maybe one um, formula, right? But that's maybe if, that's if you are going to be doing it with your handwritten approach here. If for those of us who did mathematical modeling, you would probably write an equation that would try and try to predict the way it behaves. Now, if you are not going to use write a handwritten program, then you'll be having thoughts like if the person's activity or the person's, uh, maybe if the person is sitting at so-so so angle, which is greater than 0 0.5, then the person is sitting. Then if the person, if Y, so I don't know, actually know what Y um, is, is, is less than four. These are probably, um, very, these are probably features from the person who is standing. If the person, Y um, ACC is less than four and Z ACC is greater than five. These are, these are angles actually. So it's trying to pre-check the angle at which the person is probably standing and sitting or lying down to know whether the person is sitting, lying down. This is when you are going to be doing handwritten programs. And if you are going to try and make it as accurate as possible, it means that you are going to be writing very, very, very long, complex um, algorithms and it lost so many if and else statements which might not still give you the desired results here yeah? but <clears throat> if you are going to follow the machine learning approach here yeah, it invariably means that you are feeding your you are feeding data right some sort of data from the person's activity into a learning algorithm and this learning algorithm tries as much as possible to fit itself and then fit some parameters in itself, yeah? It actually, when I say fit itself, it actually, it actually means fitting some parameters in, it, in the model that would, in future, make predictions of the person's um, activity. So I'll go into more details on this as we move further in the, into the um, course, yeah? <coughs> uh, 
Um, so let's look at machine learning and deep learning, yeah? So remember I told you that um, a more advanced form of machine learning is um, deep learning, right? So I told you, as we have said before, as we have um, I've explained before, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, right? And it learns to, to do tasks without explicitly program, without explicitly being programmed to do so, right? And we have a lot of machine learning algorithms. We have decision three. Deep learning is one of the machine learning algorithms. It's cluster reinforcement learning. They are all made here. It's trying to predict which of these. So now you can see this moving here. It's trying to say, okay, which of these are some machine learning algorithms that are very good at predicting which um, item um, is in a class that it has defined. You get. So here you are seeing different fruits, and here it's filtering them to citrus food, fruits. Yeah. But remember, I told you deep learning is more advanced. In deep learning, it goes as far as not just um, predicting the class in which a fruit belongs to, but it goes as far as using um, some more complex algorithms to like, um, like the RN and CNN to kind of describe the fruit. So now it's, it's, it's um, classifying the fruits and then giving you a description that this is blood orange and then um, it is of so, 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 so class and all that, right? So that's trying to show you that um, big learning is more complex than um, machine learning, right? Remember, if you have questions. Um, okay. So um, machine learning itself can be divided into, <coughs> into two and then others, right? You have the supervised learning, you have the unsupervised learning, and when you talk of others, right, you have stuff like reinforcement learning and so on. So under supervised learning, look at supervised learning as a kind of trying to take your um, model by the hand and then um, teaching it how to learn from data, right? Um, like it's, it's, it's going to be a bit high level for this particular um, slide. But by the time we move into um, what we have for today, that's the main content. I will explain it, um, explain it better, most especially for the supervised learning algorithm, right? So for supervised learning, what this basically means is that um, you have your data, right? And when I mean data, you can look at it as table data, right? Be a data of house um, of um, different features of a house, right? So now, if, if, if you're trying to predict something like, um, predict the price of a house, right? It means that you would have collected different features of the house, right? And then you would have a target, target variable, yeah? Which is the price of the house. So, um, when you have a target variable, right? That is when you're, you, you're, you're, you're trying to do a supervised learning, um, trying to solve a supervised learning um, problem, right? So on the other hand, if you, have, if you don't have a target variable, it means it's an unsupervised learning, meaning that your model does not have any ground truths, any, um, yeah, any output to um, learn from. In supervised learning, your model is using the features to make predictions, right? And then it's comparing the predictions it's made, it has made against the actual values that exist. So now you're saying you want your model to try and make predictions of the price of a house. But on the other side, you have the actual values of the house, right? So each time it makes a prediction, you are comparing that prediction with um, the ground truth, which is the actual prices of the house. And then you're gradually training your model to learn from the um, mistakes it made in, in, in its prediction, right? But for supervised learning, you are saying, hey, this is data. I'm not, there's no ground truth. There's no output variable. There's no why. But I needed to find um, some similarities between the data and kind of cluster them together, right? So now you are telling the model to learn on its own everything it can learn from the data, right? And um, 
for supervised learning, we have the regression and the classification kind of problems, right? And for um, unsupervised learning, we have those like cluster analysis, test, test, estimation, and re um, dimension reduction or dimensionality reduction, right? And regression on its own, it's, it's invariable, just means you're, you're dealing with continuous values, right? So the example I gave earlier is, um, that's the example of house prices, right? It's an example of a regression problem, right? Where you're having continuous values, which are just the prices of the houses, right? And if you're going to plot such, it to be of this nature, meaning that you want to find a line that best fits or best, best um, fits all the data, right? So that's what you will have in a regression problem. The class, we are, what we are going to do today is going to be around regression problem. Right, so we'll go into more details about it. And then um, on the other hand, classification problem is basically when you're having uh, um, binary classes, yeah? So you're saying, is it a cat or is it a dog? Or is it a cat, dog, or mouse? So you are not having continuous values. You're having, it is either a cat or it's a dog or it's a mice or it's either a man or it's a woman, right? So that's why you're having it this way. So now, if it has length features, or if, you are, if, 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 if this is more or less like um, a, a man and a woman um, classification, it means that on this side, you're having, sorry, on this side, you're having um, man, and on this side, you're having probably woman or anything. It can actually be anything. And your, class, your model would um, fit by, fits um, this data by drawing a line to separate the features of a man from that of a woman, right? Um, going further to unsupervised learning, the example we have here is clustering. So remember I told you, you are saying, hey, this is, a, this is a bunch of data. Find similarities between this data, yeah? So now it means that your, your, what your model will do in clustering is, it checks similarities between the features, right? And kind of clusters them together, right? So now this is just a random data, right? And you're telling your model that take this data and try and make sense out of it and find clusters within this data. What your model will do is run iteratively and then see some similarities in this and cluster them with this circle, right? See similarities in this, cluster them with this circle. And then if you check carefully, you find out that there are some similarities between every data that is in this particular cluster and every data that is in this particular cluster. And mind you, you can actually increase the number of clusters that you want your model to um, identify, right? So we'll move into, we'll go into this um, much later in the course, right? Let's move on. Are there any questions before I move on? Okay, no questions. Okay. Um, so now down to, back to, um, let's now talk about reinforcement learning, right? So reinforcement learning is the area that I actually like, <laughs> right? So reinforcement learning is a bit different from um, the supervised learning and unsupervised learning, right? So in a reinforcement learning um, problem, it's kind of using a Markov decision process to kind of make, um, kind of improve, so this time around, you will really say a model, you would say an agent. So now the idea of um, reinforcement learn learning on a, on a very high level is this, is that you're, you have an agent, right? And um, look at this agent as a baby. And you put this agent in, in a world. So in reinforcement learning, you call it an environment, right? So this environment is, is cons consists of states that require action, right? So you're telling, you're telling this model that um, learn everything as much as you can learn from this environment, right? But note that for every action that you make in this environment, there's a um, corresponding um, reward, right? So now, what it means that is that you're kind of putting the agents in an environment, right? And then it's making decisions or taking actions. So for each action, the um, agent takes in a particular state, right? So every, 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 um, in the environment, 
the, act, um, the agent is actually in a particular state. So for every state that um, it is in, it is expected to make an action. So if it makes an action in that state, the consequence. So if either it gets, you know, it, it, the agent is trying as much as possible to maximize the, the cumulative reward it's going to get at the end of um, its training um, phase here. Yeah. So you have um, reinforcement learning algorithms that learn um, close to, I can't remember how many years, but if a human being is learning um, to do something, anything a human will learn to do in say 30 years, the reinforcement learning will learn it's maybe 700 years faster than a human person would, would learn, right? So it's actually very, 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 it's a very, very, very accurate and complex algorithm, right? So here to the um, left, you would see a reinforcement learning agent that has learned to jump. Um, so I don't know what it's actually jumping. It's jumping from a plane to a, a plane, right? And on, on the right, you would have, you, you have, um, a reinforcement learning agent that played with the world's best um, AlphaGo champion, yeah, the, the, the AlphaGo champion of the world. And the reinforcement learning agent actually beats the, the world's champion, right? Um, okay. So the, here's another example. Um, so this is OpenAI. OpenAI is, um, there is a research um, company that, um, Purely does research on um, reinforcement learning. And then they built um, a reinforcement learning um, agent that was able to beat a, a world's best Dota, um, Dota 2 um, gamer in the game of Dota, right? So, like I was saying, this is what I was trying to say here. The, the Open AI 5, Open AI 5 plays 80, 180 years worth of games against itself per day learning via self play. So the idea is that it's trying to, it's learning. So each time it plays, it's, it's more or less like playing to beat itself, right? So remember I said it tries as much as possible to maximize the cumulative um, reward, right? So it in invariably means that if it's getting a reward of, a total reward of 180 after the, end of um, an episode it's possible to maximize it meaning that hey i have um, 180 why don't i have 200 why don't i have 250 next right until it's 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 kind of the the, the increase in the community what kind of flattens right so to keep trying as much as possible to improve itself <clears throat> so now let's uh, look at deep learning a bit more right so um Deep learning is something that um, came up uh, not too long ago. Yeah, I think about as of 2007 or 8 or 12, I can't really remember, right? But deep learning um, is something that has actually had, had great impact in the world. So when you're talking of things like um, very complex algorithms that can um, to speech synthesization, yeah, speech recognition, image classification, right? It's most of them are um, products of <coughs> deep learning algorithms, right? And um, there are three things that have made um, deep learning very, very successful today because deep learning is actually a very, very, very complex algor algorithm, right? And these three things are the availability of data, which or yeah, the availability, availability of massive data that um, the models can learn from, right? The um, existence of very complex algorithms that are able to learn this um, data. And then, of course, if you are having very complex algorithms that take very long time to uh, compute, you need very um, sufficient computing, um, computational powerhouse, right? So that's the existence of, so um, we have CPUs here, but I won't categorize CPUs as, um, as um, what you would use for, to learn, um, to train deep learning algorithms. You would rather go for a CPU, CPU. If you're going for a CPU, it's CPUs and CPUs, yeah, you're going to learn, you're going to train models faster than you would for um, um, CPUs, right? 
So any questions here, please? No. Okay. I'm good. Um, um, remember I said artificial intelligence is like the general. Okay. So, um, artificial is spoke about, and remember I told you that um, artificial intelligence is there are different ways of trying to achieve artificial intelligence, right? Some people have gone. Um, you have NLP, yeah, it's, they were trying to, um, NLP is, you're trying to um, process natural language in the sense that you're trying to make meaning out of natural language and more or less like um, deliver natural language in an artificial form to humans, right? You even also have speech, trying to deli deliver speech to humans in an artificial form. Uh, expert systems, robotics, vision. Vision is basically trying to um, identify images artificially, right? And then you have machine learning. And then machine learning was more or less like, the way I look at it is um, back then, machine learning was where you deal with structured data and you're trying to predict the future. For example, you're trying to predict the weather of tomorrow, right? And then it's later, later on, um, as um, research um, got quite intensive and um, and um, yeah, intensive and advanced, they noticed that machine learning algorithms could actually perform the tasks of vision, right? And um, even natural language processing and speech. And then to the level of deep learning, deep learning algorithms performed far better than the old methods of um, natural language processing, speech recognition, and vision. So at deep learning, the level of deep learning, you can also perform tasks of natural language processing, speech, and um, vision, even planning, right? Some other complex things. And it's a very, very um, wide field, right? Its application has actually grown even beyond what it was as of last year, right? Um, and Deep learning, when you look at deep learning, this is what a deep learning um, algorithm or deep learning, um, this is what the deep learning like, architecture would look like. Deep learning, it's more or less like, look at deep learning as um, scientists trying to mimic the way the brain works, right? So you will notice if, for those of us who are from the biology background, you would agree with me that um, the brain consists of, um, I might not get the the, um, the terminologies well, right? But this in deep learning, you call these nodes, yeah? But it's more or less like, I think a nucleus in the brain, right? And then you have dendrites and axons that kind of transfers information between all, to all these different um, nodes in the brain or nucleuses in the brain. I hope I'm not killing the terminal, medical terminologies here. Yeah? So, but, it's a similar thing you have in um, <clears throat> neural networks, right? In neural networks, you have different nodes, right? And each of these different nodes are, okay, someone is saying something. Okay, neurons, yeah. So neurons, so they've, they've corrected me. So yeah, they are neurons, yeah? So each of these different nodes or neurons in the brain are, um, are, are kind of, um, they are kind of specialized at, they have specialties, right? So it, it, a neuron might be able, in your brain might be able to, uh, might be good at um, predicting or, um, or processing visual um, um, data. Um, another one might be good at processing speech and all that. So it's a similar thing you have in a neural network. Each of these different nodes are good at identifying different things. And all together, they, are, they kind of um, work together to make good and um, better or very good accurate predictions based on the input data that was given to it, right? And you have different, um, different um, structures of this deep learning architecture, right? You can see that they come in different um, structures, right? Um, so now natural language processing. 
So an example of natural language processing is um, stuff like the one, what we actually did before, sentiment analysis, right? Which you, most of us um, attempted, right? The chatbots, machine translation and text classifications. That's um, most of them are the things you see in um, your Google's text to speech. That's where you have its, app its application and then so many other things. You can use it in a, um, what's the name of this stuff? Um, maybe article generation, text generation, and, and the rest of it. But you see, NLP is usually hard, right? So let me give you an example, right? So the, if you look to the right, you'd see an example of why um, NLP is quite hard because it's hard because sometimes your people, the person who is um, talking to you, um, who is writing the text for the machine to understand might actually be writing rubbish, right? So it's, 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 it's hard to build an algorithm or it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to build an algorithm that will be able to um, understand natural language irrespective of the rubbish that the user is writing, right? So you'd see, this is a very, this is actually a good um, natural, lang uh, natural language processing um, model because it's still, able, in as much as the person wrote this trash here, it's still able to um, tell the person, know that the person wants him to wake he or she up by um, 12.30, yeah? the next day. But um, if you remember, I think it was Wally, in the sentiment um, um, problem that um, I gave you guys, the first algorithm didn't do well in understanding when a text is positive and when a text is negative, right? It is because the first problem with that particular um, model was that it's not an optimized model. Second is that it could also mean that you don't have enough data to um, learn from, right? So those are basically the two reasons. Maybe there's not enough data to learn from. Second, the kind of um, algorithm that you choose to um, um, learn, right? So there are different things you have to take into consideration when um, building um, a model, not just for natural language processing, but for every other model. The algorithm you choose to use, the kind of data you, you choose to also use, and the way you actually preprocess um, the data, right? Um, so now, uh, let me just move on. Okay, see something here. If we are going to look at natural language processing in Nigeria, right? Well, I don't know why George put this to the Yeah. 300 ethnic groups in 300 plus ethnic groups in Nigeria, and um, it means that it's trying to say the hard facts of trying to build um, natural language processing um, um, data sets, which will eventually lead to models for the um, Nigeria as a country. Right. <laughs> Another problem is the languages. Yeah, so that's that's this this trying trying to trying to say um, part of trying to describe why uh, natural language processing is hard. The fact that we have 300 ethnic groups, which you have to um, consider separately, right? And um, the, the, the work it takes in trying to gather data set for these 300 plus ethnic groups, right? Then languages can sometimes be ambiguous. When you say, I love Blackberry, right? When you say Blackberry, do you mean the Blackberry fruit or you mean the Blackberry phone, right? Now, context is another thing that is a problem in natural language processing. I am hungry because I am broke. If you look at it, it's, it could mean different things, yeah? Now you're saying, I am hungry. Yeah, this, this, this one looks a bit straightforward, but I know you could actually look at it in a different way. Let me not waste my time with it. And then, Another limitation is machi machines don't understand um, language, right? So you will want to feed, um, you will want to feed raw text into your model, right? You would want to, your model understands numbers. So that's why you remember in the sentiment um, problem, we kind of tokenized each of the words before we fed it into the model, right? So you can't pass in a, I am a boy into your model. Your model won't be able to make any, any sense out of it, right? 
Okay. So um, some mach um, some natural language processing architectures I can think of are your RNNs. So I won't go into much detail. Remember, we are not doing deep learning, but this is just to kind of expose you to what exists out there. So you have RNN, you have LSTN, you have RGRU, Gated Recurrent Neural Networks. This is long short term memory, right? Um, um, now let's talk about computer vision, yeah? So computer vision basically means you're trying to build a model, right? That is able to um, make sense out of images, right? And just like in, um, just like in um, natural language processing, where machine don't understand language, right? Doesn't understand text, right? Your machine, your models also, your machine don't also understand images. So if you pass just an image in the way the image is to your machine, your machine would, might not be able to make sense out of it, right? So what you under, your machine sh would, um, you want your machine, <coughs> the other way we will try to understand is the different pixels, the different pixels in your image. Sorry, please. So what the machine will try to understand is the different pixels in this particular image. And um, I'm quite sure that we'll have an, um, an example where we'll treat this right um, sometime in the class. Yeah? Um, and you have different um, deep learning and um, computer vision architectures like um, just like we have in um, natural language processing. But in computer vision, what you would have is in deep learning, what you have is the deep convolutional neural networks, right? Where you pass in um, the pixel of your image through this in, um, input layer, and then some mathematical operations happen, and then some values that are saved in these different nodes and then you have an output which is a prediction of what your image should the class should be or you could also have an output which is also an image right so in this case in what you have done what you have done here this is actually judge right so judge um, builds um, implemented the style transfer um, um, algorithm right so he kind of mixed the style in this image right here with his own image and then this was the output so there are a lot of things you can do with um, um, the computer vision architecture right the computer vision algorithm right certification you know right Okay, so here we have um, different applications of um, real life applications of machine learning and deep learning. You have it in your um, Gmail. So this is more or less like, it, this presentation was actually for, I think Google Developers Group, right? So that's why we have everything Google, 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 right? So, um, we have it in Gmail. So for most of us, we know that Gmail as of today is very good at um, um, classifying spam and not spam image um, emails, right? And I think Gmail now, yeah, not I think, Gmail now also does, does um, this text completion, right? So when you start a text, it tries and to predict what's next you want to um, write, right? Um, you also have it in, um, Google Lens, yeah, so this is Google Lens. So Google Lens is able to um, identify what is in an image, right? And then show you different examples of those images on, um, on your Google search. Another thing that Google Lens does is um, um, image to text, um, um, image to text um, conversion, right? So you can take um, a picture of, of probably a textbook or a letter and um, it kind of understands what each text is and you can actually literally just copy the text in that image that you just took, that picture you just took, copy it and then paste it in your notebook. So for, for lazy people like me, 
who they give, um, if they give me, if I have probably a letter or probably a document that I need some information from, and it's just half copy. I will just use, I just actually use my Google Lens, take a picture of it and copy out the information I need from it, right? Um, another is a Waymo. So Waymo is Google's self-driving car company, right? And it uses a lot of um, complex, um, sorry, complex, it's, there are a lot of complex algorithms that make this possible. Uh, this is Google Talk, yeah? or Google Assistant, I think, yeah? So this Google Assistant, of course, we all know Google Assistant. Um, it kind of understands um, our speech and gives us response, translates the speech, makes meaning out of the speech and then responds back in speech, right? We, use, we also know Google News. Google News uses an unsupervised means to give us um, news that are uh, fit for us, yeah? So I think it uses clustering, right? But I'm sure they've gone a bit more advanced on clustering. Then we have um, Google Maps, which is um, the wizard of today. Um, some very funny algorithms make Google Maps, as well I can see. Um, so this is what I was talking about in your Gmail, text completion, right? So it uses um, RNN to make this um, text completion possible, right? Predicts the next word. Then aside this, you also know the um, spam and no spam, which is, I think everybody um, got to know about um, Gmail first, right? Then um, this is Google Lens, right? I've already described and explained what Google Lens does, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is still Google Lens. You've been able to copy text from the image, right? And then this Google Maps, the wizard of today, of this, our age. Um, and Google News, so it uses clustering, like I said, recommender systems to give you news that are best fit for yourself, right? Then Google Assistant uses WaveNet, right? WaveNet is a speech recognition algorithm, right? That's kind of, or speech algorithm. Let me use the word speech algorithm. That kind of, um, so it, 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 speech synthesis basically. It synthesizes your speech and make predictions out of your speech. Not really done so much on speech, um, speech algorithms, right? Then um, Waymo. So Waymo is not, um, it's not, there's no, you can't point at one algorithm that makes this possible. You have um, a lot of algorithms that make this possible. And a lot of robotics um, and things, or implement things that make this self-driving car possible. It uses a lot of localization, computer vision, even speech recognition, speech and the natural language processing. When you're talking about, when you talk of interaction between the vehicle and then the driver or the passenger, because in this case, there's no driver, right? Um, so um, this, these are the sensors and um, devices that make um, the self-driving car possible. So this is what, this is your vision system. So definitely you have some form of computer vision algorithm that makes, um, that and makes your self-driving car see and then know when it sees a human on the road, when it sees the traffic lights and then the lights, um, the traffic lights are saying, hey, I'm red, you shouldn't be moving, right? Then, um, there are some areas, some other very complex. It's not limited to what you're seeing here. There are more things that make the self-driving car possible. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about generative adversarial networks. So generative adversarial networks is one of the um, very, very interesting applications of deep learning, right? So in a generative adversarial network, I think I should be done with this slide in the next five minutes here. Generative adversarial networks, you're having, it's, it's a bit different from every other thing that we've been talking about. In this case, your model is not predicting anything, right? Your model is actually generating things from what it has seen before. So it, it, it's, it's, it kind of works with two different, um, two different um, 
networks, right? So you're having one that is a generator and one that is a discriminator. So what your discriminator kind of does is, it's quite high level for now, but just look at it as one neural network is trying to understand um, data and one um, other network is trying to, um, is trying to generate the kind of this, the, the data that this one is kind of trying to understand, right? So it's, it's going to be, I'm going to leave it in that high level form for now, but look at it as generative adversarial networks and networks that generate things that um, are not real. Let me use it that way. Generate things that are not real. And I'll give you an example, right? So now, um, an example of where you would see um, a generative adversarial, an example of its application is, I know of um, a particular um, website where you, if you, um, if you start, you can actually sit and point out that, okay, I want to draw a cat. And then you start the drawing. You don't need to complete the drawing, but when you start the drawing, it completes by itself. Behind that um, engine is a generative adversarial network. So the generative adversarial network has learned to draw cats. So no matter how you start the cat, it's more or less like you're feeding in noise, right? It will kind of complete that drawing that you're trying to um, achieve, yeah? No matter how ugly what you started is. Another um, application of um, generative as scenario and talks is what you have to the right. We did actually a video, yeah? So now, uh, what you have is a horse, right? To the right, to the left is a horse. You can use your generative adversarial networks that has learned um, um, what zebras look like, right? And try to change this um, video or this image of a horse to look like that of a zebra. And it's almost as accurate as you can think of, right? So you see that this is, there are still some form of imperfections in the one to the, um, to the right here. Yeah? For example, look at the tail. You'll notice something is wrong with the tail, right? Yeah, then you also have it in music generation. You can actually teach, um, you can actually build a generative adversarial network that can learn to play music like a um, Mozart, yeah? Um, I think, yeah. <laughs> so I think I would, I would skip this part, <laughs> yeah? So now that we are going to start machine learning, right? Um, the few things that I would need to tell everyone is that, number one, machine learning is very, very, very large, right? It's a very, very wide field, right? And um, it's, it, you, cannot look, you cannot find everything you need to know machine learning in one person. Now that can you find it in one website? And that's why you see here, it says Google is your best friend. There are a lot of resources, a lot of articles that um, you can use to um, start um, machine learning or you can use to improve yourself in machine learning. So try as much as possible to make um, Google close to you. Then another thing, is um, curiosity. The more you're curious about something, right, the more you try out that thing, right? And even if you fail, right, it shouldn't mean that you should just stop it. Try again until you get it. And then, as usual, I would say, also collaborate with people who have tried out stuff like that and see how you can make it come to life, right? And then just try as much as possible to <coughs> Self-educate yourself, right? Self-educate yourself. Don't don't depend, don't depend on any individual, don't depend on your university. Self-education is as good as anything. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to school. Though. If you need to go to school, go to school. But try as much as possible to learn things on your own, right? And I think that's the end of this slide. Right. Um, so I'll take a pause <coughs> because I actually lost my breath. Not even feeling too fine. So to just maybe two minutes to rest. Well, I can answer questions between this during this time. So if you have any questions, please. Questions.
So, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. So, um, um, how do I put it now? So, for instance, now there's it's just a rough example. There's a machine learning project. So, what's the difference between a machine learning project and uh, a deep learning project? A reinforcement learning. Like, is there a difference, or is there a place where they all come to meet? as one or something uh. hello hello yeah i can hear you yeah that's my that's my question like i wanted to know where do they all meet what point And uh, I can take a pass at that question. So if you want to, there's always this debate about machine learning, deep learning and all this stuff. And I don't think it's healthy to get into it. But the, the thing everyone agrees on is that deep learning is a sub field of machine learning. So basically you can think of machine learning as everything, uh, but then Deep learning is a part whereby you're, you're doing something other than just um, classical machine learning. So when I, what, I, what I mean by classical machine learning is that in the, uh, okay, you remember? No, we've not gotten there, sorry. So you cannot, like, I wouldn't say remember. So when we get into machine learning, you would um, get to familiarize yourself with some algorithms like, um, linear algebra, log logistic, sorry, linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, and all this stuff. So um, there are techniques that are different from the deep learning algorithm. So if you say, to come to your question, which is like, what, what do you mean by machine learning project or deep learning project? Um, that's your question, right? So I don't go off the rails. Yes. like. What is that? That's one. Then two. Is there a point where they all meet? Um. Okay. Yeah. I'm. I'm, I'm on track. So when um, these days when people talk about deep learning projects, that means they're building some neural networks. So we are also going to treat that in the machine learning class. Then you get to understand what what it means by um neural network or all those things that all those buzzword i'm training around right now if you're not familiar with it so if i say i'm i'm working on a machine learning project so it's, it's funny because usually when i talk to people i say um i'm a machine learning researcher and almost all the time i'm researching audio and i'm using deep learning techniques you get what i'm trying to say so why don't i say i'm a deep learning researcher but because i like because um, I could decide tomorrow that um, the, the question, um, um, my research question requires that I use some, I, I, I go to the classical machine learning toolbox and pick up some things from it and do it. Do I come back to say, no, I'm a decision tree um, researcher now. So it's just machine learning is like the overall, um, like, it embodies everything. But some people say they are like deep learning, like they're working on a deep learning project just to be specific. And by the way, this is my take on this. Um, someone else might answer the question in a completely different way. So there, there is no right or wrong answer. It just depends on um, what you're doing. But if you're working, um, usually if you're doing things that are like, maybe that you're using the state of the heart, um, deep neural networks to solve your problem, then you'd most likely say that, uh, categorize it as, as you working on, um, like you working on a deep learning project. Like everyone understand that you, you can't say you're working on a deep learning project and then you're using decision trees or logistic regression, you get? So it's like, we know that you're doing, but you have, you're probably having like, um, like a, lot of, a lot of neural networks, deep neural networks to be precise. You're like having different layers, you're bombarding things together, it's like, on another level. You get what I'm trying to say? Well, if you come to me and say you're, you're working on a machine learning project, then I'll think maybe you're like um, testing out this like very famous, um, um, very famous Titanic projects where you're just like, uh, you know, still like, uh, like 
not you are not using the very sophisticated technique which is like the deep neural network when i mean sophisticated because you can also come to argue what um, sophistication means you can say some of the algorithms are a lot um, like might seem like that they are not deep learning but they are also very sophisticated in their own way so i'm going to leave that as an open discussion but i hope um, from from what i said so far i'm here i'm able to communicate the difference if it's not i can take a second pass to try to to explain you know um to give a more concrete answer yeah i, I understood what you said so it's like the entire thing is based on machine learning right yeah. so irrespective of whether you're doing a deep learning project a reinforcement learning project yeah. you are onto machine learning business yeah right? Yeah, okay. machine learning is the parent. Then you okay. under machine learning, you have um, like then you have deep learning or as in a part you, you you know a lot of people debate this. It's a very interesting debate. So, but just okay. machine learning is the like it's you can define everything as machine learning, depending. Okay, so I'm sorry. I okay. No, I don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. What's the other question? <laughs> okay. So, like, I know, okay, um, programming, normally, you would, you, before you carry out a project, you would know, you'd have to um, research to find out what best, which one would best fit your, um, the purpose of what you want to do. So, like, is there any other way, like, okay, for instance, I want to, I want to be able to um, teach my stuff about countries, for instance. So in that kind of situation, so how do I tell that, okay, you need to use reinforcement learning here, you need to use deep learning here. And all okay. that. I don't know if you get my question. All right. I, I understand your question. Um, I can answer it, but I want to first ask permission from Kenichi if he, he has something to say before I go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right, amazing. Okay, so uh, when you have a project, if you ha when you ha have a problem, there is um, something you're trying to solve, right? So your problem your problem lends itself to the solution that you decide to use. Um, I, sorry, just one second. I'm reading a comment. Someone says machine learning, I think, deals with numerical data. Deep learning deals with images and text data, and reinforcement learning is all about agents learning from its environment with a view of getting a reward. Then I think AI joins them together. I stand to be corrected. Um, Not okay. Really. Not really, yes. That's the that's short answer. <laughs> um, but the long, and um, that, I'm just going to correct one very quickly so in machine learning you you can also use classical machine learning methods to to work with images to be honest why deep learning was such a huge success was because researchers got tired and it wasn't working very well using machine learning to solve um, like images like it was terrible because now you you're moving to a lot of features like they had to like add, add code features you know all this conversation like is interesting we can always go into it in a later lecture just to uh, not um, overstretch the how are here so let me come back to this um, your question which right now I'm trying to remember what it is <laughs> <laughs> okay like how do you tell how do you tell what um what which of the tool to use from the match oh yeah because... and now i remember okay so <laughs> sorry for that I'll, I'll i'll pay a lot more attention next time so i was going to say that it depends on the problem you're trying to solve so for example if you know that you um and your the problem you you ex the example you mentioned was that let's say you wanted to say make prediction for country countries is is that the simple example you 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 mentioned yeah yes 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 okay so um what i'm just going to refine it a little bit, bit more say i want to predict um based on some features i want to predict um what i want to tell which country this is is that a good problem 
exactly exactly okay. thank you yeah so you can see that i'm already refining the problem you started with saying that let's say we just have some countries which is very undefined like what do you mean by something what are you trying to do what is the question you're trying to ask then we move that to say okay we have some features of country based on this feature is it possible for me to be able to predict that um they are countries but um i like when saying I have some features, it means that I have historical data, right? Um, and for those of us that does not know what, what, what I'm saying by, what I mean by historical, it means I'm just saying that we have um, a bunch of data that says column A, um, feature A, B, C, D is equals to Nigeria. Okay, let's give an example just to make it a lot more concrete. Uh, in, what are the basic features in Nigeria that you can use um, to, to say that um, Nigeria is, is a country? Um, so now I'm trying to think on the fly. Can people can jump in to like give me features? The flag. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Each country has a unique flag. Amazing. If you only have that one, imagine you have just one feature, which is a flag. Honestly, you, you can build a machine learning model that would be hundred percent. Please correct me if I'm wrong. If we have more flags that like, <laughs> can we use population? Because like a city can... So that's another more... feature. You could use population, but there, there is also possibility that a, a, another country b could be the exact population as Nigeria. You get what I'm okay. trying to say? So that okay. could be another okay. feature. But you can see okay. we, we, like now we, we have a defined problem. We are, we are now coming, we are trying to think on the fly, like what are the features that are important for us to be able to um, make a, a good prediction. You can see. So uh, aside the algorithm itself, you have to define the problem and decide, uh, we'll get into it um, in, in coming lectures, and decide if um, the problem you're trying to solve is something called a supervised learning problem, or if it is something called an unsupervised, a supervised, which ju just mean that, just what we've said, we have a bunch of features um, like features that define what a country is. And we know that all those countries, we have a label, which is Nigeria, um, Germany, you get. So you have all those labels. So you have that data. You're not saying that um, given, let me train a model, or let me train a machine learning model. Given this and any country in, in the random country that was not, maybe you did not train with it. Given random country, or is it possible? I mean, of course you would, I'm, I'm, I'm almost going to contradict myself when I said I'm not trained with it. I'm not going to go get into it. So let's say, uh, given um, like you, all your data, you, you, broke, you broke them down into like two subsets. Are you still following me? Please let me know if I've gone. Too yes, fast. yes. Okay, so no, let's no, no, say no. You, you have a huge data. So um, which, which has all the features of the countries and then the name of the country, all the countries, um, um, in the in the world, it's about two hundred and what? How many countries do do we have? Can someone help me out here? Google. Okay. Anyway, it, it's not very relevant for this discussion, so I, I, we we can check that up later. So let's say we have um, in total we have maybe like I'm not going to say number, so I don't feel like <laughs> I don't feel weird after this conversation. So. Um, Let's say we just have a, a huge data set of all, of all of different features than all the countries. And then we decide to divide that data into say um, a train set and then um, a test set. So let's say we use 90% of the data to train a model. You get what I'm trying to say? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, so we like right now we are going to use 90% um, of the data to train the about 190 or 195 countries that someone has, um, thank you for putting it on the chart, um, to train the model. And then after we train a model, we want to say out of those subsets that we left on um, for the test to test, we use it to test our model. So you take randomly, you take any of them, you pass it through the model and you expect it to give you the correct country. You get what I'm trying to say? So you okay. can see that. So this, this problem that I, I just explained to you, uh, once um, the tutor ex um, goes through the lectures and details, it will come back to you. You understand it as something called a supervised learning technique. 
Okay. So sorry, just one more. Just one tiny bit, just one. No, L, no, so no, you can yeah, it's fine. Just um <laughs> <exp> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so so for this problem now, yeah. Are we going to say the feature, the flag feature is enough? We don't need extra features. Oh, Would that's interesting. The flag feature give us an hundred percent um accuracy. Oh, we so, need yeah. more features. So this, is, so, so this is this is very very this is a very good question. So let's say um like the explanation I just gave you when we were talking about like um like if we said we have a feature that is looking at population. You can see this is a this is um this is not this is that integer right like i mean i'm trying to use i'm trying to find the right word but anyway so let's say uh like you have a column in your database that says the um the population is a is a is a feature or the flag is a feature but that would be really weird because when if you want to deal with flag alone and i know from my uh, from my knowledge from my background knowledge that no one country has more than one like as um, more than one flag. I mean, each country's flag is unique to the country. You get what I'm trying to say? So I could yes. definitely, that is a very good um, feature. It's, it's like right now, same feature now, I want to move into the computer vision realm. Because I remember I heard Kenichi talked about um, images, right? Yes. So, so, so if you want to use um, your knowledge of what it means um, for like knowing that each country's flag is enough for you to be able to predict that it's a country, then what you would do is that for each of the countries, you find you you gather different kind of like I mean it's a, this is very weird because just having one one flag is is enough to say that it's like green, white, green. But but like thinking about it, it's it's, it's even much more interesting the way, the more I think about it. So let's say you you take different um. Diff different ways in which you can take a picture of the flags. You get what I'm trying to say? And then maybe, um, and then you pass it through like a, a computer vision mode, like, sorry, not a computer vision model. Yes. Ap apologies. You pass it through like a, a convolution neural network, which is another algorithm that help you deal well with images. Then that's, given that those, those, um, like those, images which of course they are also numbers um in some sense but given those images you can use that to predict uh if like if these flags be belong to which country yeah so um to answer your question is the flag feature enough i'm trying to find the right way to not to not mislead uh, mislead you because be, the way i had said like flag as a as a feature now, if you want to add more feature, then I'm, I'm describing the problem, how you solve this problem using flag alone. I, I've already like moved into another domain. You get what I'm trying to say? I'm not sticking to say you, you just want to use the classical machine learning okay. technique. Then it becomes another, a tricky question. Like, I mean, you could, okay. you could use the flag, but then it would be a lot of, because um, images have, a, uh, if you take each of the, each of the pixel, would be your features. You get what I'm trying to say. So that means yeah. you're not. So you're con considering all the pixels in the image as your feature, and then you're trying oh. to like do machine learning. So which which also works. I mean, it might not be as efficient or as the as using a a, a con con convolution neural network algorithm, but um, it's, it does the job. Does that answer your question? We can talk offline. Yes. Well. Okay. If I'm not no, it's it's, there. it's no problem. I I get it. If I ask, uh, if I have further questions, I'll just ask. All right. Thank Thanks you so much. Shima. That was a really interesting question, and uh, I hope everyone was able to gain one or two things um, from the conversation. Yeah. I was told that my time is up. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just really <laughs> Jamie is asking a question. Okay. Um. Let me. Um, okay, Jamie, speak. Let me just take your question, Jamie, then we'll continue. Hi, Kenichi. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, I want to ask why you're so, every time you mention a uh, Google map, you're always wow. As in, <laughs> what's, what's the... <laughs> so Google map consists of so many things. I can't even point out to one thing, right? 
Google Map consists of so many things, consists of complex algorithms that even I myself, I don't know, to be honest. So you are having stuff like um, speech, speech um, for, for example, now Google, talk, um, Google Maps speaks to you, right? So you have some form of speech, some speech algorithms there. <clears throat> You're having some localization algorithms there. You're having, it's, it's really, really well. That's the thing. That's what I can say to Google Maps, right? It's really well. <laughs> but hopefully by the end of this class and for some of us who are going to do the planning, we'll have people who will build Nigeria's Google Maps. Hopefully. Yeah. And then Chidima, um, for some of the questions that you, yeah, it's, it's some of the things might be kind of um, confusing now, but I, I think by the time you, um, you get to a particular level in the um, course, some things will get clearer, right? Some things will surely get clearer. So I'll start now, right? Okay. <coughs> I'll start now. Um, so I was going through, um, how many of us went through um, the, the class notes, the, the, the class for the, the CMU um, notes and videos? Just signify by raising your hands. Wow, nobody. Okay, one, one, just one person. Man, okay, let me just move on. So, um, well, I remember, I, like I said, it was quite impromptu, right? But I went, kind of went through the slides and then I noticed that what you have in this slide is almost exactly what you have on the um, notebook, right? And um, while going through it, I felt it might be a bit um, difficult to kind of grasp the um, concept if you just go through this. So I would have to probably pick up an example just as it was in um, similar to, um, to what it is in um, Andrin's, Andrin's course on Coursera and try and um, describe the concepts very well in the next, um, hopefully in the next 30 minutes. Then another thing, um, for those of us who tried out the, um, the notebooks, I, I'm sure most of you have difficulties um, finding the data sets, right? Because I think the website where the professor picks his data from, they've kind of changed a lot of things on the website, right? And then it's not, it's not an Excel um, document anymore. It's a, it's a CSV document. And um, the way he kind of um, got the data or the way he kind of read the data and processed it, is, or the, kind, the way he kind of read the data is quite different from what you would ha um, do, from what you would do with the CSV formats, right? So I already um, downloaded the data, right? So I'll send it to everyone, but this is the URL. And then I wrote um, some code to kind of preprocess it so that we would have just exactly what he has, right? And so for that, for now, I'll go and I'll start by um, explaining the concepts from scratch, right? And I hope everyone can follow. Okay. Can everyone see the white screen? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so help me God. It's been quite some time since I did this. Um, let's see. So, um, Everyone remembers what I said, yeah, that um, in machine learning, we have supervised learning, Abby. Um, am I supervised, Abby? And unsupervised. Right? Sorry, my handwriting is very terrible. Someone sent something on the chat. Yes, okay. 
supervised and unsupervised, right? Um, sorry, we need to push this thing down here, right? And um, like I said before, for unsupervised, you'll be having stores where um, you just have your data, right? And um, so let's look at the data, is, let's look at it as a data in, in a table, right? And then there is no ground truth. So if you are having the features as X, it's invariably saying that there's no Y, right? But for supervised learning, it's more or less like we have um, a ground truth, yeah? That the, the, the whatever prediction you make can um, correct itself from, yeah? So invariably what you're saying here is, in this case, you do not have this, right? You don't have this. But here you're having data, right? And then you have a Y. So you're having X and you're having Y, right? So this is the basic, um, <coughs> this is on the high level, this is um, the difference here, yeah? where you have X and Y and where you, don't, you have X only, right? So let me give you an example, right? An example is, um, let's say, like I said before, let's do a house prediction example, right? And um, if we were to um, predict the prices of a house, now this is a supervised learning, um, a, a supervised learning problem, right? If we we're going to predict um, the price of houses here, it invariably means that we are going to have some set of features, right? I don't know how many of these features we would have, right? And then we are going to have, which is X. So the features are X here. Yeah? yeah. And then we are going to have a Y, which is the um, ground stretch. Yeah. So we just have a Y. Yeah. So now, what is going to be our Y? So I'll be, I'll be moving on. I'll be using questions to um, teach from now. So what is going to be our Y? You can just um, reply by sending a chat. If I have one answer correct, I'll move on. The price. Okay, the price. Yeah, makes sense. So what we are going to be having here is the price of the house, right? Yeah. Um, why is this thing not writing completely? Okay. So, but for us to predict the price of the house, there must be some certain features that we should be able to use to predict the house, right? So let's say, for example, now, we are building this, this whatever we want to build is for, say, Lagos State, yeah? So what are the different features that we can, um, we can say that, can, what are the different features we can see that can, that would correctly predict what the price of a house would be? So um, I'll take these features, um, just reply the chat and then I'll write them down. Okay, so we have um, number of bedrooms. Okay, location, yeah, size of house, okay. Which other thing can we use? So it's, it's, it's in Lagos State, yeah? Which other things can we use? Okay, car park space. Proximity. Okay, so proximity is quite ambiguous. Proximity to where? To what? To a strategic location. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Proximity to, say, bus stop. Mm -hmm. To a landmark. Okay, yeah, uh -huh, the landmark. landmark. Uh -huh. Mark, yeah. So which other thing? 
furnished or not furnished yeah so now you see that we have there are so many things that you can i'm seeing stuff like um year of construction crime rate furnished and um, or furnished number security of people, security you get so you see that there are so many features that you can consider to correctly predict what the price of a house is right and yes. all these features you can reduce these features to um you can reduce these features to numeric values yeah <laughs> right so what you would have in fun is this let me clean up this what you have in turn is this you would have um what name? it's not really easy using pen you would have a table yeah of all your features yes okay so where each column um sorry please No easy to send this stuff. Okay. Where each column, yeah, consists of the different features that you have, right? And each row, yeah, each row is your training examples. So you can look at each row as M. So M is the number of rows that you have. So you can say number of what? Training rows. examples. Yeah? Right? So what it's, it's trying to say is that you cannot use one data point to make a good prediction, right? You need series of data points. You need large data, right? You need training examples you need a training example that should be spanning. So depending on what you're trying to solve any kind of problem, but you can be spanning to like 300 data points, 400, thousands of data points, right? So it means that you are, you are taking, you are having house prices of, say 10,000 house prices and 10,000 features of those house prices, yeah? So if you're having um, features, say 1,000 features, yeah? It invariably means that your Y, you have 1,000 prices of houses that correspond to each of these features. Am I right? Is it clear? Yes. Okay. So now, the idea of uh, machine learning, or yeah, the idea of machine learning, or linear regression, because we are starting with linear regression. Sorry, I didn't say that. So we are starting with linear regression. Linear regression, because that is what was um, thought in the um, course, linear regression regression right not um not so linear regression is quite different from classification problems different from logistic regression and the rest yeah in the sense that um i already said that before linear regression you are dealing with continuous data yeah but logistic um, regression is kind of you are dealing with um, discrete data so um can you imagine i'm looking for those stuff i think i'm, I'm, I'm I suppose we hope what discrete or continuous means. You can try. Let me clean off this. So, when you have, um, this brings me to what um, Chidima was trying to say. So, for each different, for each problem you're trying to solve, the structure of the problem will lead you to the kind of solution you should apply, right? So in this case, we are having house prices, yeah? So we have different features, yeah? And then what we are trying to predict is a Y, yeah? Oh, I'm not even writing anything. So as I was saying, you have um, different features, yeah? You don't know what the features are, let's just say, but you have a Y that you're trying to predict, yeah? And this why is house prices here. Now you cannot, your house prices cannot be binary in the sense that um, your house price cannot be a fixed value. You can have, have house price 250,000, right? 200,000, 150,000. So it's not, a, it's a continuous, it's continuous, yeah? It's not um, A or B. I suppose um, um, a classification problem where if you want to predict if, so now let's say it's a cancer problem, yeah? You want to predict whether it is malignant 
or benign, right? Malignant is, um, so I think malignant is when it is um, the dangerous, that's when the person has cancer, and benign is when the person doesn't have cancer, yeah? So it's either you're predicting a malignant case or a benign case. You cannot have anything other than these two. That is when you're, you're dealing with a classification problem. But when you are dealing with continuous data, like in this house price example, you are dealing with a regression problem, a linear regression problem, right? And another, another example of a, linear, of a problem that you use linear regression for is, um, say you're predicting something that has to do with time, right? <clears throat> for example, um, let's say you want to predict the time when somebody will come to um, rent a bicycle or something like that, yeah? You want to predict the time, or you want to predict the number of people that will come to predict and uh, to um, rent a bicycle at a particular time. So now, what your object, what you're trying to predict in this case is, you're predicting the number of people that are going to come to um, rent a bicycle. You cannot have it as five or 10. It's continuous, yeah? It can be one, it can be two, it can be three, it can be four. It can be any number, it can be anything, yeah? <clears throat> and a simple way you would see linear regression problem is, like what everyone has seen in their um, school, yeah? Let me clean this. Um, what everyone has seen in school, right? Um, I have a panel, I'll call you more. Okay. Trying to learn how to use this stuff. Okay, so what everyone will see is, what everybody, yeah? Something similar to this. So how many of us remember this in, um, in school? So let's say these are all points, yeah? Where um, your secondary school teacher will tell you, um, he will give you some data and tell you that you should draw a line, that you should um, plot the points on a Cartesian plane. Then after you have plotted the points, so this is your y axis, and this is your x axis that you should then draw a line them. such that so what, what they will tell you then is what they will tell you then is that and um, such that the the last points here and the topmost points here must join each other or they will tell you that uh, the number of points to the right and the number of points to the left if you draw a line must be the same right how many of us had such experience in school here? Yeah? So, well, I think most of us had such experience in school, yeah? But that's basically trying to find the line of best fit and it's trying to actually solve a regression problem. And the idea is that if you are able to draw this line, something that most of the teachers didn't actually tell us, the idea is that if you are able to draw this line, you should be able to make future predictions based on the value of X you are giving or based on the feature that you are giving. So, but this is just a simple case. Is a linear, it's just a simple linear case where you have your y equals mx plus c, right? Which most of us remember. So invariably, what this is trying to say is that if you're able to draw this line, then they will go ahead to tell you, find the gradient, right? And the y-intercept. So let's say this, my intercept is at um, zero, yeah? It invariably means that my c is equal to zero, and my m is equal to, they will tell you then that you should do something like this, and then you find your y, um, let me write it y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? So the idea then is just to find this value of m and this value of c, such that if you are bringing in any new value of x, right, it should be able to give you the prediction y, which invariably also means that if you're able to draw this line correctly, if you bring any value of x and you put that value of trace that value of x on this x plane, the corresponding value of y, which is going to be somewhere here, is the prediction for y. So whatever prediction you have here, the same thing you have with this equation right here. Am I right? Are we clear? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, is it that my network is not good or something? Hello. Okay. No question. No questions. Okay. 
Okay, so where was I before I came here now? <laughs> okay, so now we're talking about the house prices here. So now, the, the, that is, what I just explained now is how um, we probably did it in school, yeah? Where you're trying to um, find, you have, you have, okay, sorry. My pen is not ready. So you have a Y, yeah? Equals MX plus C, right? So I'll change this Y that we use then in school. I'll change it to H, right? Is equal to, right? Um, I'll change this M that we used then in school to your theta um, one, right? And I'll call this X one, right? And then I'll change this C to your theta two, right? So you can call these values of theta your parameters. Yeah, so the idea is that you want to find, you are trying, you are actually trying to find the correct values of theta, yeah? Theta one and theta two, such that, um, sorry, such that when you have these correct values, if you bring in any new value of X, it will be able to give you a fairly correct prediction of what your y would be. So invariably, what this means is that if you have a ground truth y, yeah, whatever this model should give you, yeah, should be close to what your y would give you, right? Do you understand? So what it looks like is this, in essence is this. Um, let me clear this drawing. What it looks like in a sense is this, yeah? Um, you are having a training set, right? So when I say training set, what it invariably means is that, is that whole um, data set of house prices and the house prices and the features that corresponds to the house prices, yeah? So that table of house prices features and then the house price itself. You have that training set, and you're passing that training set into a learning algorithm, right? And that your learning algorithm, in our own case now, if it is a linear problem, right? What you are going to be having as your learning algorithm is H equals um, theta one X plus um, um, theta, right? So in a very simple case, this is what we have, right? <laughs> right? You are going to be passing it to your learning algorithm. And then your learning algorithm is going to give you a hypothesis, right? H. I think I switched, I, I missed out something. So basically, this is your learning algorithm. Let me clean up some, let me clean this, sorry. Um, you are going to pass it through a learning algorithm. So in this case, let me, let me clean up this, yeah. It should be this, sorry. Um, sorry. So you're going to be having um, a learning algorithm, yeah, right? And this learning algorithm is going to give you a hypothesis here. Yeah? So it's going to give you theta one x one plus theta, yeah? So this is like your hypothesis. Such that once you have this, whereby you have your value of theta one and theta zero, yeah? If you're going to bring in any new data, so in our own case, this time around, is the size of house, yeah? So let's say it is only the size of house that we are using as our feature. And this X represents the size of house. So now if it, it invariably means if you are bringing in any new size of house, right? X, right? It should be able to give us what? An estimated price. Ah, man, I thought I was writing something. This thing is, 
So you should be able to give us an estimated price. Right? Was I the one who wrote this? Okay, I think Tejo wrote this, right? Okay. Okay, so do we, do we kind of understand what I'm trying to um, describe here? Any questions, please, before I move on? Any questions? Okay, no question. So, um, what I've been trying to say is this, basically. Instead of, um, in, in, in machine learning or in linear regression, there's the machine learning linear regression this time around, right? What we are going to learn this time around is that instead of what we did in, the sec in secondary school where you have your data and then you were told to plot your data on a Cartesian, right? And then you, by your own hands, found the line of best fit, right? And then you were able to find the values of um theta one and theta zero based on the slope of this line of in quotes best fit and um the um y intercepts right you instead in machine learning want to pass this same data here into a learning algorithm right that will learning algorithm um, uh, okay. that would in turn, right, give you these values of theta one and theta zero in a less stressful way. And more accurate. Right. And I'll explain how we do this um, next. But before I move on, any questions again? Because I really need everybody to understand it. Any questions? So let me start. Let me continue since there are no questions. So what it means is that, remember I said that there's a hypothesis. Yeah? There's a hypothesis. And then this hypothesis is more or less like our prediction. Oh, I thought I'm writing. Mm, this is wrong. So remember I said there's a hypothesis, yeah? And this hypothesis, yeah? This hypothesis is more or less like um, the prediction or an estimate. So what we want to do is this, yeah? We know the actual value, the ground truth, which is why. We want to kind of pass every of our data points. So in our own case, we are saying X, we are having just one feature X, and X is what? Um, size of house. So we are, we, are, we are using a very simple case for now. So if X is size of house, yeah? And um, Y is the price of house, of house, yeah? We want to pass in every feature of X. I make a prediction H, yeah? So now we are, let's say we now have another table of H, right? For every data points, we are making a prediction H, yeah? And we are having our values of H here, H here, H here. And then after we have done, we want to more or less like find the error between the ground truth and the predicted value. In the sense that we want to know how far away is the hypothesis how far away is our hypothesis from predicting the right value of y? And if you you will notice here, the the the, the um our our the ability of our model to predict h correctly is solely dependent on these values of theta one and um, theta zero, right? And for us to kind of find this error, you can invariably look at it as um, your y minus your h, or your h minus your y any one of them, right? Depending on which is greater, but you wouldn't want to use this, right? This is more or less like um, on a high level. If you're just using just one data point, you're like, 
what is the, how far away is this prediction from this? You just find the, 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 the difference and you know that, oh, this was what you predicted. If you have added so, so, so amounts to it, this is what it will give you. For example, now let's say the price of the house is 500 naira, right? That's why it's 500 naira. And our H is, um, our H, our prediction was 200, right? If you want to know the error between the predicted value and then the, um, the ground truth, it's very just 500 minus 200, right? Which will give us 300. So invariably, it means that if we add 300 to, five, to this 200, we'll be having 500 at it, which is, which, ah, I thought I'm writing something. I think I need to push this thing back. We'll be having 500, yeah? If we add this, we'll be having 500 here. And if it's going to make a prediction based on what it has learned now, right? It is going to be very accurate to give us 500. Paul, now we are not dealing with just one data point, yeah? We are dealing with so many data points. And invariably means that we cannot just do a Y minus H. And that, that's what leads us to um, the squared error, mean squared error loss, yeah? So what mean squared error loss is like, is more or less like finding um, an average, this, um, an average um, error for all your data points, right? So it's more or less like um, look, getting a, a value that kind of gives a sense of the error for every data point in your data set, right? So what that formula looks like is this. Um, yeah, so what it looks like is this. Quite all right, you're having your hitch, which is a prediction minus your y, right? But you are squaring it, right? To remove every negative value. But now you are not just finding for your for just one h and one y. You are finding it for all the h. So that's why I put an i here and all the y. Yeah. So you have another i here. So for all the training examples where that um, superscript of i um, indicates um, all the training example, and you are finding the cumulative. Yeah. You are finding like the sum of all the errors from the first training example to the empty training example. So remember I told you that the total number of um, um, data points is M when I gave you this year. So if you have so many, if you have 1,000, it means your M is what, 1,000, right? So you are taking from the first training example to the empty training example. So it's for all the training examples. And you're finding something like, you are finding an average here. Yeah? So it's more or less like over 2M, yeah? So some, some people use this too. Some people don't use this too. It depends on, um, I think the researcher, but I use two. But I'll explain why um, two is used there based on what um, was explained by Andrew, H, by Andrew Inc, yeah? So now, remember this is the sum over all the training examples for, for you to find um, the average is more or less like saying all over the total number of training examples, right? If you want to find average here. Yeah? And the, the, the essence of the two here is more or less like to cancel out this square that you have put over here, right? So that's, that's this, is, this is like, this is your, this is your um, formula or mean squared error loss here, yeah? or your mean squared error that you kind of use to find, to know how well your model is, um, is doing in training, right? So what this invariably means is that after if each, um, after each um, training that you've done, after each training, it training iteration, right? You find an error and then measure how well your model is doing, yeah? The next step actually is now to kind of, yeah, to you kind of measure how well your model is doing, right? So this is more or less like the loss. I don't want to jump so we don't get confused. So, what this basically means is some people would say J, like Andrew N, but for the course we are using, it's an E. So I would use an E. 
So this A stands for your error, which is a function of the parameters, yeah? So your E is invariably what? Your one over two M, yeah? The summation of um, I plus one M, yeah? H minus Y squared I, I, right? So this is, this is your, this is more or less like what gives, this is not more or less, I like using that one. So this is what gives you um, the error, gives you a sense of um, how well your model is doing, right? But um, finding the error alone doesn't more or less, it doesn't improve your model, right? You still have to find, remember that I, I, what I said is that, um, what you're trying, to, the, the, the values you're trying to um, get is the values of theta one and theta two and theta zero, right? Because if you have your y equals mx plus c or your y equals theta, sorry, theta one x plus theta zero, yeah? It is these two values that are going to give us, that are going to enable us to make good predictions. So it invariably means that from this loss that we have gotten, yeah, we still have to find a way of getting the right values of theta based on what we have gotten here. From what I told you before is if you, your, your loss is 300, it means just add 300 to um, 200 and then you have 500. But that's not what you would have in this case here. Yeah? What you would have in this case is that for those of us who are quite familiar with mathematics, yeah, for those of us that don't, um, have so much strong foundation in mathematics, it's still not a problem. Yeah? Just try and follow and grab as much as you can grab. You would, you would know that if you have um, something like this, yeah? Um, and you have a line here, right? The gradient of <laughs> this line or this loop. Hello. I can hear you. You want oh. to say something? I just wanted to ask a question before you get into gradients and descent, mm -hmm. um, just to see if everyone is following. When he said that you can add 300 to the loss and when we had this, our problem was solved. But can you think about this? Like the question is that it's not just one data point. It's not just one person's house that determine the loss you get. You have a lot of different houses. So that means each of them would have to make a contribution. You need to uh, intelligently know how to add or remove from them for them to be able to accumulate in a way that when you add everything um, up, when you get everything, then you, your, your loss, um, you know, is a, you're able to like, it's accumulating to like adding 300. I think that's an interesting way to think about it um, before we get into the old mathematics of gradient descent and all this stuff. Does that make any sense to you? Okay, no, no reaction. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay, so um, there's an illustration I would want to give to but let me try and um, see if I can explain something first. So if we have, um, say, a curve, right? And um, you calculated your error, right? Let's say this is a plot of, so this is, a, let's say this is a simple plot of your um, error, right? Against your, your theta, let's say theta one, Right, let's assume theta zero is equal to zero. Right, there's no theta zero. If our error is at this point, yeah, for such a um, plot, what we are trying to do is minimize this, um, the error function, right? Minimize it such that it finds its way. Down to this point here, because what the, the, the distance between or the, the deviation between y and and um, h is very minimal. Yeah. So if our error is at this point now, yeah, that's our e. 
how can we move down this um, discipline such that we get to this particular point? I won't go into serious mathematics here, but basically what it invariably means is that for us to move down, we have to find the differential of this with respect to this um, theta, yeah? For those of us who went through the, um, the materials, you see the, the derivation of how of um, this particular um, partial differential, yeah? So the idea is this, to just keep it simple. Our error is at this particular point now, yeah? The whole point of what we are doing in machine learning is that we want to move this point from this particular place down to this particular place and then stop at this particular place. Do we get? And for us to achieve this, it invariably means that for us to move, take a step downwards, we have to find the partial derivative of the error function with respect to theta. Do we understand? Hello. I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> I want to know if we are still going to go over um, understanding why we just need to use the partial derivative. Because as a good um, th thought experiment, you are at that point E or epsilon. I'm not sure which symbol you're trying to use. And do you want to move down? I think it should be E. So you have that point E, which is error. I want to go down to that star. How do I get down? And you said that we should just use differentiation. Why? Mm -mm. So that? I've not gotten there. I've not gotten there. If I'm if I guess it clearly, you are talking about where we use this, yeah? I'm guessing there. No, no, no. I'm talking about um, this one. You said the, I'm talking about the the um, the e d theta that you just said. Um, you you said that if you want to move from the e down to to get the minimal loss, then we need to find the partial deriva uh, derivation, right? Mm -hmm. At that point. Okay. Is that so, what you said? That's what. Yes. Yes. And I'm asking why. So, 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 so the partial the partial derivative kind of gives us. It, take, it gives us a very, you know, the way partial derivative is this, it's more or less like, it gives us a very small differential. Uh, how, what's, the, what's the word they use? It's more or less like gives us a very small um, variance between of the error itself. And if it gives us that small variance, this time around is moving towards the negative slope, yeah? Okay, right. so, um, Yeah, negative slope. So it's giving yeah. us a small, change. So partial de derivatives, giving us a small change of that error, right, which we can actually then use to update our weights. That is why we're using partial differential. So, <laughs> I'm sorry for keep interrupting because I, um, I remember when I, when I was just new to this um, subject, everyone just like go, go over it so quickly. It feels like you're supposed to understand it. And now it feels a lot it's, more interesting because because I, I have better intuition, right? But um, when you say it gives us a small change, it's it's more like, um, what's the, like, how, if you change something, like if you change your error, how does it affect your theta? Like how, it's like a small change in partial difference, sorry, calculus, basically, you have to like take a calculus class just to like um, di di um, dive deep. And it's a prerequisite for this um, particular course that we're we are taking. But just um, just know that you, you to gain a better yes. intuition, then you have to understand what it means uh, when, when you're talking about di differentiation. And it's not in the way of you cramming the right dx. It's just no, like no, no. The intuition. So you're, you're moving in a direction. You want to move in the direction of um, lowest loss, like um, descent. Then that means that uh, what, um, the change, what's the smallest change you can make that can move you into the direction you want to go to? So I like, think, think, think about the, D, the E D theta as what's the smallest change that I make now that would move me closer to my goal? 
Yeah. <laughs> so, did everyone get? Maybe I didn't explain it better. Is anyone confused? Okay, someone raised his hand. Yeah. Um. Hello. Yeah. Good morning. Um. Yeah. I just have a couple of questions, right? So, okay. um, first one being that, how did we get the curve? I'll get to that. I'll I'll explain okay. that. Okay. So, um, then the next, the second one is so we're doing we're looking for um the most minute um change in. Um, say the direction of the slope, right? Well, how how do we how do we account for like the value of mean squared error that we got? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work. I think I will bring everything together. I think you, Every uh, Kene, mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like you we moved too too many steps ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the the thing is, the the issue is that the the cost that we are going through here yeah, go assumes, right? assumes a lot of things yeah, yeah. So maybe before this i'm trying as much as possible already i already said in the beginning of the class that we can't cover everything today it's not okay. possible can it change for this part we use uh, andrew ink's course do you think that's a lot more informative I, I think it's more i think it's better we use andrew ink's course yeah I think we use so better. We like use maybe we just course. dedicate the um, next class to using that. We're not going to like um, go over everything. Everyone has to help us out here as well. So it's just like um, a brush to the main fundamentals and then give it as an extra resources. Then we continue well, with the course. Well, I, I think I think the notebook used for the CMU class. Yeah, the, does this this first um, notebook is Actually, also informative. Yeah, yeah, so they can also still go through it while they go through. Um, yeah, ideas. exactly. It's, it's very, very important. I, I, I skimmed through the notebook and I think mm -hmm. it's, I mean, you know, because it's different. You and I have a lot more experience. So um, it looks very straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, just like go over it and then it, as, okay, you, so as you discover something you don't understand, you, you jot it down, but go over it like continue okay. to go over it, try to understand as much and if you don't understand something you jot it down and then ask it as a question or something okay what will happen is this yeah i'm going to try as much as possible for the remain i think we have just about 20 minutes to go uh, Try as much as possible to go over everything as I actually wanted to do. But if I can go yeah, to that particular destination where I want to get to. So what it means is that by next class I'm expecting I'm expecting questions. So let me just move on. Someone asked how we got this curve. I'm going to explain how we got this curve here. Yeah? I'll use a simple example to explain how we, how we got this particular curve. So um, I already I said that the, the partial derivative of um, your error with respect to your theta is more or less like trying to move your error from its particular, it's more or less like find, trying to find that's um, infinite, is it? In, they call it infinite. Shall it, it's trying to find a very small change in that error, right? It's called right? infinitesimal. And it's not that change in the error is towards the infinitesimal here. That word just keeps. <laughs> so it's it's trying to find a change towards towards this direction down this slope. So this the, whatever whatever algorithm you write that tries to reduce this. Um, Error. Someone, the mic. Someone's mic is um, listening. So, whatever um, algorithm you would use to, you would actually need an algorithm, yeah, that will kind of reduce this error down this slope, so to this point where the uh, the error, yeah, the or the change, the error actually is very, 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 very minute. I can't really change again. Yeah, and. The algorithm you use for this in the 
as you would see in Angie's course. And what it means is that if it is optimized, it means you have good values of theta. Yeah, let me just use the word theta. Good values of theta such that if you're making any prediction based on an input feature, based on an input feature um, X, yeah, your prediction H will be very close to your Y, right? Will be very close to your Y. Um, now, someone asked a question, how did we get this um, call? So, let me clear my screen. Um, so, let's assume, um, for us to use a very simple example, like, um, I think that, like the one that was kind of illustrated in Andrean's course, yeah. Let's assume um, we have a hypothesis H that is, that is kind of equal to um, X theta. So now we don't have, um, so let's say X one theta one, but our theta zero is equal to zero, right? If we're going to, um, if we had a value, say, if our value of theta, let's say the training examples for this particular problem, let me write the training examples here. We had just three training examples, y and x here. Yeah? And where x is one, y is one. Where x is two, y is two. Yeah, x is three, y is three, yeah. If, now, if we say that, um, if we say that our theta one, if we, if we, if let's say we finish training our, um, uh, what do you call it, our model, and then we say our theta, sorry, out, Oh shit! I would say our theta one is equal to one. Yeah. Here we have one, two, three. Yeah. And um, here we have one, two, three. Right. If we are going to plot um, H of um, x1, yeah, where this theta is one, yeah, times one. What would have is something like this, yeah, as h equals x, where this different point. Right? Let me draw a line here. Am I right? This this is more or less like a very perfect, um, a very perfect um, what they call it um, hypothesis. Yeah, where your theta is one because our um, theta zero is zero. That's why your intercept is at this point zero. Yeah, and what it means is that for every value of um, x that we put in, the corresponding value of which is the same value as x because theta one is one, right? So where we put x equals to one, your h is equals to one, which is equals to this same y here, right? And then if you remember, if we are going to find, let's say now this is our hypothesis, our hypothesis will invariably be um, h, where x is one, y is one, h is one, where x is two, h is two, where x is three, h is three. Yeah. So now if we are going to find the error that's between your um your y and your h, remember we agreed that um your error is um one over two m, yeah. Summation of um i is equal to one is for m of um 
your h minus your y, right? Squared. If you are going to find the error for this particular training example, what we are going to be having is one over, so we're having three, yeah, B? So it's going to be three training examples here. Yeah? So we're having two times three is um, equal to, is equal, is um, into brackets. So for the first training example, since um, H is one and your Y is one, we're having zero squared here. For the second training example, your H is two, your Y is two here. Yeah? So zero. Um, right? Oh my God. And this will give us what? This will give us what? Oh, sorry. And um, don't worry. Zero. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So people are responding. Let me share this thing over here. Zero, yeah? So now, if we are going to plot, remember this is your E, or you can call it your J, yeah? So now, if you are going to plot a graph of your J, right? And your theta, in our case now is theta one. This is zero, right? Uh, man, I thought I was writing something. Wow, everything has cleaned. My God. I'm sorry guys, I'm using two devices and I'm, I'm using one to write and I'm using the other to um, project. And it's, it's, quite, it's quite frustrating managing the two of them at the same time. Okay, so as I was saying, think of, if you're going to plot a Cartesian, yeah? Okay, so as I was saying, if you're going to plot a Cartesian, yeah? Where this is zero. And this is your theta one, yeah? If you are going to plot, you remember this is J or E or theta, yeah? For J equal to zero, and for the value of theta, what is the value of theta one, which is one here, right? Let's say one is here, is here and you're having um, 0 0.5, no, let's say 0 0.5 is here, right? And then we are having 0 0.5 here, and this is one, two, three, four, yeah? For theta of one and j of zero, your point will be somewhere here, right? Now that is when your, 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 your value of theta is um, one, and that is more or less like a perfect situation. But on the other hand, if you're having something like, um, if you're having something like, uh, let me clean up this. If you have your value of theta to be, say, um, let's see, cleaner, 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 cleaner. Okay. So let's say you're having your value of theta to be um, um, say zero point five. So you're having your theta one this time around. It invariably means that our plot. If this, was a, if this was a perfect plot that we have here, it really means that our plot would be something, um, our, our hypothesis this time around would be H is equal to um, X or 0 0.5 X, right? And our plot would be somewhere around, um, I think somewhere around, is it here? somewhere around here, right? Such that, yeah, I think 
somewhere around here. No, sorry. Somewhere around here. And this is how it's Um. Um, sorry, trying to somewhere around here, right? It's somewhere around here. And if you are going to find our hypothesis for each of the training examples, okay, what it is this? Our h, yeah, and x. So when, so I'll be asking questions now because I don't want to, I don't have calculator on here. When um, x is one, what is our h? If this is our, if our model is um, like I've said before, h is equal to theta one x. What would be our h? Zero point five. Okay. Zero point five when um x is what one. one when it's two i hate to be one one when it's three one point five one point five so this is our prediction right and this prediction is quite far away from um our y yeah and the idea is that the distance between yeah the distance between this each of these um um hypothesis value and 0 0.5, 1 and 1.5, you can see it as the distance that you are having here, yeah? So this is more or less like how far it is from the actual value, right? And remember we said that if you want to have, if you want to more or less calculate the, um, the loss, we go back to the formula which we had defined here. Right? And if we are going to calculate the loss, we'll be having um, E is equal to 1.1 over 2 over times 3, yeah? Is equal to what? This time around, we are having um, 0 0.5 minus what? 1, right? Squared plus what? 2 minus 1 squared plus um, 1.5 minus squared. So if we calculate this, sorry, what do we have? For those of us who have calculators with us, squared is here. And in five minutes more, I just extend it to one. Okay. What's this answer? Sorry, this is this is not equal to these times. What do we have? <laughs> I think what we we'll have is something around. 1.5, I'm not sure. So the idea is this, yeah? You, what you're going to be having is something around 1.5 for your E. And if you're going to plot your E again, 1.5 at 0 0.5, yeah? It's going to be somewhere here. And if you keep putting random values, you'll find that, that maybe the next one will be somewhere here. If you're going to use negative values, I think you're going to be having something around here, here. And in the end, what you would have is something, a curve like this. Sorry, I cannot draw this thing. Yeah, so this is what you have. So this is how that curve came to be. Oh, man. Sorry, I need to run. So this is how that curve came to be, yeah? So what it's trying to say is that this point here, is that point you are trying to go, you are trying to reach that point of nearly perfect, right? And then your error can start at any point on this curve. 
It can be here, it can be here, it can be anywhere, right? And the point is that you want to try as much as possible to move down this slope, right? Until you get to this point. Do we get? But now, this curve, you're seeing this curve because it is just for a function as simple as this. When you're going to be having more than, um, when you're going to be having more than one, um, uh, one parameter, yeah, say theta one and theta two, yeah, if you assume you have theta one and theta two, you're not going to be having a Cartesian plot like this. You'll be having a three dimensional plot if it is two values of theta. And as the number of pictures increases, the number of picture, um, parameters will actually increase, yeah. Um, what you'll be having is more, is something, something like this, maybe um, this, yeah. Where you have your j, theta one, and theta two, and then you'd have one three D plot of a curve. So it's a three D plot of a curve. Let me just use a bucket to describe it. And then your model is trying to go down and trying to get to this point here, right? So that's that's it. But now that's just everything we have just discussed now is trying to find the error, right? Trying to find the error. And um, before um, I move to this, we're just talking about using um, your partial differentials here yeah, to find, to kind of move down that slope to get to the bottom of that slope here. Yeah. But this doesn't do anything to your parameter, yeah? So this is our differentiation. So um, training process, the value of your partial differential of your error with respect to theta. You can actually use this partial differential to update your value, theta, yeah? So now let's say this is uh, with respect to theta one, right? For you to update your theta one, it invariably means that you'll be having something like this, right? This is what you'll be having. So if this is a very small change, right? Um, sorry, let me go down. So if this is a very small change, if this is a very small ch um, change down the slope here, yeah? it means that if you subtract whatever value you have here, from this value of your current value of theta, right? It should kind of, it should kind of um, update your value of theta such that it should be able to make better predictions in the next iteration. But it would be, it would be um, catastrophic if you are making very, very big steps, right? So in machine learning, there's something that we call um, learning rates. You want to kind of control how fast your um, model learns. The idea is this, if, you're learning too fast, right? Let's say this is that curve again. You are at this point, right? If you're learning too fast, it invariably means it might be taking very, very big steps, right? So let's say, say it takes a big step. It comes to this point. It takes a big step. It comes to this point. It's trying to get here. It might take another big step and jump to this point. Take another big step and then jump to this point. So the point now is that you want to restrict it to taking tiny, tiny steps that you can control, right? So that's why we introduce the value, the, we introduce the learning rate, which is alpha. So learning rate is is that small um, value that kind of controls the the steps that um, your um, parameter, which is theta, takes when updating itself. Do you understand? So this is. This whole um, thing that we, this is more, this is your gradient descent algorithm. This whole process I've explained is how you, you do gradient descent and updating your weights. And if you do this continuously, iteratively through your model, you will find out that the value of theta will get to a point where a change here will not really change anything, this value of theta. It, it could, it, it, this value of, um, of your, your partial differential multiplied by your learning rates will be very, 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 so very, very small 
to the extent that if you're subtracting it from this value of theta, it won't really make any change here. At this point, it means that for this curve that we have been describing here, you have gotten to this point. You have gotten to um, this point here or something very, somewhere very close to the, this point <coughs> on, your, on your curve, right? Um, is it clear? So now let me let me bring everything together before I before we close because I think we are running out of time, right? So this is basically it, right? You have your data. Um, sorry, let me turn off this again. Sorry. So you have your data, data sets here. Yeah? And your data set has a ground truth here. Yeah? yeah, so you can just see your Y, right? You want to pass this data set iteratively through your hypothesis, yeah? So in this case, it is a linear, um, is univariant. So univariant just means that it just has one feature, right? And then you want to generate um, a hypothesis H, right? You want to then measure the error of this um, H with respect um, to your value of Y, right? And for you to do that, you are going to be, you, like we said, you are using um, um, 2m, yeah? From i equals one to m. Um, right? You want to find this error. And after you've gotten a sense of this error, you want to use the information from this error that you have gotten or from this cost function you have gotten to then update your value of theta yeah right and then when you update this value of theta you are going to go again and then pass that same data set again through your h with the updated value of your theta and then make another prediction and see how far away it is from your y value and then update. So now you do this continuously until you find out that you have gotten to this point. If you're going to be plotting the loss E, yeah, probably um, each of the loss that if you, let's say, let's assume you're saving the values of the loss, yeah? Let me remove this. Sorry. You will find out that your loss, if your loss was at this point, yeah, it will kind of reduce, reduce, reduce until the point where it's no longer changing. At that point, it is at this particular position here. So by the time you get to this point, it means that you've trained your model, that this particular model invariably means that you've gotten the right value of theta one and theta zero. Yeah? Um, why did I move it again? I've tried everything. I imagine. It really means you have gotten the right value of, you've gotten the right value of theta one and theta zero, such that if you have um, new values of, so let's say you now have your theta one as in zero point five um, x and theta zero of zero point zero two, if you bring in a new value of x. Let's say this is the house price and prediction that we have been talking about. If you bring in a new size of house, whatever you have here is close to the, close to the price of the house that you be. <laughs> that is, is there real life, in real life, right? So that's actually everything in a nutshell, right? And um, if you go through, if you go through um, the, 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 um, the notebook by Enzico, 
it's the same thing he's trying to um, do, right? In this case, he's trying to um, predict, um, I think he was trying to predict, um, what was he trying to predict again? Peak demand, yeah? So he was trying to predict when um, there will be a peak demand in um, Pittsburgh based on the temperature at that particular point in time, right? So it's still um, similar to the house prices. You're trying to predict house prices based on the house size. And then if you go through the code carefully, yeah? At, let me try and just go through it quickly. Three minutes. Oh, do I need to? We're actually out of time. Deep planning has to start now. <laughs> so I just go through it, yeah? And then if there are any questions with the notebook, just buzz me. But well, I'll be sending out links to um, Andrew Engie's course on um, Coursera, the ones that everyone should start with. And then I'll also be expecting that everyone tries out this notebook and tries to see or understand everything that is in the notebook. It's, it's basically the same thing as what I have um, explained from start to finish. Uh, like I said, I'll be on Slack to answer everyone. Yes. Is there any question so far? Let me take questions before I close. Any question at all? Any confusion? Is there anything you want me to go through maybe in the next five minutes? Or am I offline? Any question? Hello, Kenneth. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the class and all. Um, I hope it's not a side question, but I noticed when um, we were collecting parameters, when we were collecting parameters to use to determine the price of a house, one of the things we mentioned was location. Location. Yeah. And I also remember you said that um, we are dealing with, I think, continuous data, something like that. Yeah. So, location categorical, can we put a categorical um, feature in our linear regression model? Yeah, so when I said what we are predicting, I wasn't talking about the features, yeah? I was talking about the ground truth, which is why. Right, so the feature is quite different from why. When I say continuous, it's the crazy, it's the ground truth. So that's what when you see things like the house price. But you can actually have categorical features and continuous features in your data set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're going to be having the location of the house, yeah, what you now be if if uh, there's something you call, we call one hot encoding. I won't want to go into that now. But what you typically do is one hot encode the different locations. Yeah, so Lagos, um, Abuja, um, Ilori, you get the different locations you want to help encode them. The idea of one hot, hot, one hot encoding is that you're trying not to um, put meaning to the numbers. So now if I, if I had said Lagos 1, Abuja 2, Ogun 3, um, for that court four, right? Of course, your model will say, look at uh, court as greater than Lagos. But in the real sense, there's no, um, there's no, um, there's no, um, let me use the word. Lagos is not greater than Ugun State in this case. They are just categories. So in this case, you have to use something called one hot one hot encoding. Uh, I think I'll leave you guys to do more research on that before I go into the explanation of one, like what of what one important thing is. Yeah. Okay. Can I, I get that? Yeah, we are doing it to ones and zeros. Yeah. Okay. I get your point. So, but what I'm talking about is, for example, we're considering Lagos, and then um, there are some locations in Lagos that will demand the higher price. Like right? we know, Banana Island should not be the same price, even if it's a is a is a bungalow. With what you find in maybe Badagri. So, how the, the location source of it influences the price. So, how do we include that in the, um, among our features? Okay, let me, let me go, go over it again. Yeah. 
when I was giving the example, I, I, I remember I restricted it to Lagos, yeah? And then in this um, explanation I gave just now, I was looking at Nigeria as a whole, the different um, states in Nigeria. Now, if you are looking at Lagos here, yeah, each location has um, its part to play in the price, yeah? That is just one feature. Location is one feature, right? Now, you are now going to more or less like say, let's say you are looking at um, the first row. And the first row says that the house is 350,000 naira, right? Now, 350,000 naira is just there. But you're not saying that because it is, it is 350,000 naira because it's in so, so, so location, right? And in as much as it's in so, so, so location, these are some other features that makes it 350,000 naira. So now you can have so many features where the location of the house itself is just one of the features of that house that choose the price of the house. Just to do you get both the feature of the we can have okay. Um I understand your question and if you want to if you start thinking about it in terms of Nigeria then you're asking another question. So let's say, just like what you said, uh, we are in Lagos, we want to know um, how does the, the location influences the price, what happens. Or if you now want to ask another question, say that in Nigeria, what, what are the features I need to use to decide on which location? In fact, it's my, it might be that um, states is a very, very important um, important features that you need to have. So you need to know if a, if a house is in Lagos, not just if a house is in Lagos, Victoria Island, you, you see? So it's like um, you, 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 you could also still move further down. So this, this features, this house is in Lagos, then where in Lagos is this house located? Is in Banana Island. Oh, that's why it is this. Another house which is in Lagos, but is in um, Ibed, I'm sorry, Ibedu Leki or something. Like it's also still expensive. Um, say it's in Ikorodu, have this price compared to a house in uh, Ibadan, which is also like almost the same price as the house in Banana Island. I hope you get what I'm trying to say. So it's just like you you can have um, different like features, like different column just to um, ca catch that. If you don't just want to use the like the fine-grained information. You can also use coordinates, to be honest. So just like GPS or something. That's Thank it. you very much. I understand. I understand. Yeah. What? Thank you very much. I understand. I understand Kenneth and your explanation. Yeah, that. Okay, we are good. <laughs> More questions. Chidima asked a question. She sent it to me before you started the class, the machine learning class. So maybe I can read it out. I, I thought this was an interesting question. So she said that, um, can you train a machine learning model to, to do more than one prediction? For example, you want to predict if a food is carbohydrate, protein, etc. Also, you want to predict what ingredients was used in the food. You also want to predict what country have those food. You also want to predict the closest restaurant that has the meal, like real-time prediction rather than the static prediction. Yeah. So it's asking if a model can be trained um, for all four, four questions you have, or you have to create four different models. So I think that's tending towards AGI. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when I saw the message, I'm like, <laughs> one model fits it all. <laughs> That's AGI, yeah. But for now, yeah, you what you would have is you are training a model to um, perform a specific task. So, but if you are going to have your model do um, series of things, right, you would more or less like bring in different models together, right? So an example of one that I have done before, I think Teja has done it also, is um, you're trying to predict um, the the a 
a type of dog, right? You want to predict okay. um, the breed yeah. of a dog. You remember, yeah? Yeah. So now, for you to predict the breed of a dog, right? It means you'd have trained a model to predict dogs, right? And the truth is that um, if you bring in any random image to that particular model, it will still bring um, point it to a particular dog, even if it's a human being. But now you need to, first of all, predict that it's a dog before you predict the breed of the dog. So there's something we, there's, that um, is out there, the um, ImageNet data sets, right? And there are a lot of models that perform very well, pre-trained models that have been trained on the ImageNet data set. So basically ImageNet data set is just 1,000 classes of images, different images. So you have dogs, you have cars, you have aeroplanes. I actually don't know all the 1,000, right? So the first is step it like is, the Open yeah? Vino Toolkit, like the IBM Open Vino Toolkit. No, no, no. So now we are talking about it's not IBM. It's for Intel. Intel, yeah. Okay, sorry, so, it's Intel. Sorry. So um, that's that's a toolkit, right? It's not the data set. But but just to answer your question, sorry, sorry, I jumped in. I, I'm an Intel <laughs> innovator, so so I'm like, oh, that's Intel too. Uh, but yeah, OpenVINO sort of like is a very neat tool that helps you do um, all these tasks, like um, computer vision related tasks. On it's another thing. It's just like your um, yeah, your you're trying to use on the cloud or let's say you want to do on the edge. Then you're looking at their more videos and give me five minutes, please. Yeah. Sally is already giving, it's already giving okay. me a sign. Sorry. Okay, so um, let me just quickly. So um, you, you train, so what, what was that? What was that? So yeah, you have uh, your ImageNet data set is 1,000 classes of images here yeah, that has been trained to very, very high accuracy, right? So the first step was to, first of all, predict that it's a dog. If it's not a dog, you tell the user that this is not a dog. So I can't predict the breed, right? So once it has predicted that, oh, this is a dog, then you now go ahead to pass that particular image that is a dog into the model you have trained to predict the, the breed, right? So you see that you are bringing in different models that are good at different things to get your desired um, um, outcome, right? Does that answer the question, Chidima? Yeah, yeah, a little. Sorry. Little. Yeah, I'm saying. Okay, you said something about AGI. Like, what's AGI? I, so I know you're going to explain it. Just... Intelligence. <laughs> Artificial general intelligence. Yeah, and I, I know it's still something that is still under um, intensive research. I've actually not put my hand there before. But the idea of AGI is that have one model that can do all these things. We can yeah. discuss a little bit further, like what you what you're saying. Maybe in another class, it could be an interesting class discussion. Okay. Or, I, mean, I don't. No, want to, no like, problem. Yeah, no nice problem. Because, but we okay, can. No problem. That's next class. <laughs> okay. No problem. No problem. I'll wait. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? I'll pick just one because I've begged for five minutes. I, I told I told them you you join you start the class in ten minutes. Maybe like in eight minutes now. Minutes. Okay, eight minutes. So let's take one question. One question. Let's get two questions. Any confusion with all the things I wrote, all the stuff I wrote? Okay, so now who can tell me the process, like I have explained, of training a model? Because the, the truth is that if you can um, kind of um, not cram this time around, because if you cram, it's just a waste of time. Who can? kind of tell me that process from the top of his head, the process of training a model. You are going to actually sit in all your journey of machine learning. It will keep coming again. So who can just like walk us through that process? That was the last thing I, that was the last thing I said before I closed. One person. I'll give that person Thank $5. You. Oh my God, that's a lot of money. Can I, can I, can I say it? Sit down, Joe. <laughs> My check. Yeah. I think who was the first person? Was it Ademola or Jami? Okay, they are both. So Jami wants to go. And, um, 
Uh, we are two of you should go. I'll divide the five dollars into two, two point five dollars. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. We only have you can go first. All right. Um, so to train your model, first of all, you need to have your data set with you. Yeah. Then let's say you have uh, 100,000 data sets with you. Then you need to split your data set for training and um, testing, right? The training, the training part is to train your model. After training it, then you feed it with your the test data set to just be sure that your model is not memorizing um, the data used to train it, right? So uh, kind of restrict it to the, the ones I did in class. Ademola, please try and restrict it to what we've done in the class so that people don't get confused. We'll get to that splitting later, right? Let's just restrict it a bit. Okay. So continue. Okay, so once you have your data set, you select your model. Then it, it, the term, it, okay, the first thing is you need to know your problem. Is it um, will you be using supervised learning or unsupervised learning? Now, if you're using supervised learning to solve your problem, then you need to know is it a classification problem or a regression problem? So to know if it's a classification problem is if what your model wants to predict, if it has a finite, um, number of predictions, right? Is it, is it cat or dog? Is it um, benign cancer or malignant, right? That's for classification. Why for regression is when you want to predict um, values, which, which can be, uh, which is not finite, which is not discrete. So once you figure that out, the next thing is to now apply your algorithm. That is the model you want to use to train yeah, the learning algorithm you want to use for your to solve the problem you want to solve. Then after selecting it, it if it's a regression problem, then you can choose linear regression. Right? So then after using the after knowing the um, algorithm you want to use, the next thing you do is to feed data into the um, algorithm and you can plot you can you can plot um, the learning rate of you can plot the way your model is learning to know if you actually um, to know if to know that it's predicting something uh, just to show that you have any model. four minutes now. Okay. Um, also, oh, no, no. Round, up so round up quickly so that round up quickly so that Jamie will speak. And your learning also determines how fast um, it's, it tends to get to the zero minimum of predicting. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Drum rolls. <laughs> okay. I, the first thing is to get your data sets. Mm -hmm. After you might have gotten your data set, it is, you, you check the data set if it is continuous or discrete. Continuous in the sense that do you have a classification or it's a regression? Then you look for a, a good model. If it is a regression, you take one of the algorithm in a regression, which is an example is a linear regression. So after which you feed your data, your data set into your model, into your algorithm, rather. So then, to in order to in order to get after after feeding your data set into your algorithm, you look for you check the error to know how far your 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 model is moving away from the the how would I put it <laughs> uh, to check the the accuracy of your model to look for to bring the error down to the minimum, to the, to the infinitesimal, not actually zero, but close to zero. So then you repeat that step over and over to get your best uh, model. That's just it. I think, I think Jeremy was closer to what I actually wanted. So I'm writing it now again. Just put it in your head, right? Then 
Ted, am I allowed? Yep. You have um, two minutes, roughly. Okay. Can do it in two minutes. Hmm. Sorry. You're writing over my text. Hey. Hey, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm cleaned off. I hope I don't clean you up. Mm. <gasps> it's okay. <laughs> okay. It's okay. I think they can all see it. It's just to remind them to go by the lectures. Um, it's okay. okay. Go ahead. So, um, um, oh, okay, your, your time, time up. No, don't go ahead. Uh, so just just look at it. Everyone will remember. Just this. It. Just, let me just say one thing. 30 minutes and 30 seconds. Let me just say one thing. Please now. Okay. So you, you, like I said, you have your data set. Try and make a prediction from this whole data set. Yeah. Find the error. Use the error to update your weight. Go back again the loop. Find your hypothesis, find error until this E, until this um, theta doesn't change any. It's changing very, the change is very, 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 very tiny, right? At that point, you have trained your model and you've gotten the right values of theta, right? And uh, one more thing, mind you, okay, we'll do that next week. Yes. Matrix, that's what I wanted to say. Exactly. So, <laughs> matrix, you have to you have to know a lot of do a lot of matrix multiplication. Okay. Um, yeah. Once if you if you uh, don't understand anything, just put it on Slack. Great. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your uh, afternoon, your day, and uh, have a nice time. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Keep your physical distance if you can. Okay, bye-bye guys.